Hello, welcome. Welcome everyone to episode 184 of our 98 Crisis Jam. I'm uh, Chuck Browning, the Chief Medical Officer at Recovery Innovations, also known as RI. And I'm fortunate today to have a packed Crisis Jam full of interesting information. A lot of it ties into some of the pre-show stuff that we just talked about. Our main speaker today is going to be Phil Evans from Protocol, uh, talking about firehouse model and underwriting crisis crisis availability. So really looking forward to hearing you talk about that, Phil. Um, as always, we give a little background on the 98 Crisis Jam. That you can go to our website, sign up for updates, see prior recordings, check out materials. Um, remember that you do have to register for the Crisis Jam and have it connected to the Zoom account, uh, one Zoom account per one registration, uh, so that making sure that your device's Zoom account matches up with what you register for to be able to gain access. So now we'll move into the latest crisis news. We've got three or four updates, I think, today. Uh, the first touches base on a recent um, publication put out by Boringer Ingelheim, a pharmaceutical company who was looking at uh, multiple different barriers to uh, clients and patients in there um, that were dealing with schizophrenia. And with last week's episode on early psychosis, there was a lot of talk in the chat about stigma. And one of the findings that they, top three findings related to challenges with access to care. And one of the findings of this whole discussion was bar barriers to access. But one of the causes of that was thought to be stigma related to the diagnosis, even with the medical system having stigma about how even how to help support uh, folks with this diagnosis. So please check that out in the link uh, provided in the chat to be able to see some interesting information on that. Um, we're going to be talking a little bit later on today. Uh, Carissa in the SAMHSA section is going to talk about 988 Day, uh, which and about the 988 Day activation workshop coming up. And the link is already in the chat for that. But I think Carissa is going to touch base on that when we get to that section. All right, so I think last week we talked about an opening. Speaking of underwriting capacity and access for crisis care, we talked about an opening last week in Maryland. Um, now we're talking about a new opening in the Kirkland area uh, near Seattle, uh, where Connections is opening the uh, county's first walk-in crisis care center. And if you can see, uh, this is an image of uh, prototype of, of the typical 23-hour um, observation and treatment center uh, where people, it's it's the real gatekeeper that really maximizes uh, emergency um, emergency care systems and diversion from emergency rooms and law enforcement. Um, let's see if Chris, if Chris, if you are on this, would you like to just speak real quickly? Let me see if I see there, you. Yeah, there you are. Hey, everybody. Thanks, Jack. Um, and thank you for highlighting this. Um, I guess um, July 29th, is going to be known as like National Announce a Crisis Center Day because you had your event um, in Maryland. And in addition, we had our event out in, in Seattle, King County. Um, and it's also my uh, wedding anniversary. But um, we're super excited. We had a lot of, you know, and at the current moment, I think your presentation on the firehouse model speaks well to the fact that it really does take a village to stand up these centers, as you all know so well at RI International, and um, it's just been a major community effort from the five cities, the county, the state, um, and all the leaders that participated in the in the opening last week it was just a great success. We're really close to opening our doors in the next coming days, so everybody's really excited in the community to offer the really in the Pacific Northwest the first type of center that Arizona has enjoyed and SAMHSA has made a national best practice around the country. So we're super excited about it. Look forward to sharing our outcomes uh, and continuing to partner with all the crisis advocates on advancing this great work. So thank you so much for highlighting it. It was it was so coincidental when uh, you all reached out and we saw online that social media that we both did our announcements on the same day, but it's just speaks to the need uh, and the great work that we collectively do to um, give a national best practice um, operator to come into communities and serve this unmet need. And like I tell people, when there's an unmet need, there's a way, and that's what we've been successful collectively in doing together. So thank you, Chuck, for highlighting the pictures and there was some nice press on it as well. So I really appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. And we'll look forward to you being on our panel after uh, yes. Bill's discussion as well. Okay, and great. On that, in 
in that same lane, but just a little bit over is another resource we wanted to share with you. Um, you know, with connections, uh, our, our very often frequent contributor to the Crisis Jam, uh, Dr. Margie Balfour, um, and our uh, friends of, of both of these folks, and, and Dr. Matthew Goldman, who has been in a directing uh, direction of care and crisis uh, systems in the Seattle area, in King County area. And so they have this new crisis services and issue of psychiatric clinics of North America, volume 47 as a resource um, that had about 13 major practice oriented topics. And the link here is how you can uh, access this information um, and, uh, and be able to see the latest and greatest being put out and organized and as the co-editors from RG and Matt. And now we're going to get into our crisis hot seat. So today we are not having a particular person in the crisis hot seat, and there's a reason for that. We're putting the audience into the hot seat. This is the third total time that this question has been shown um, for our audience over the years in our crisis jam, and it's actually one of the questions that has been the most challenging to have a correct, consistent answer from the audience. So three times a charm today, we're going to get this covered and then our voting. So here's the question. Phil Evans, who's going to be presenting in very shortly, is our CEO and president of Protocol Services, runs one of the largest crisis call networks in the U.S. He says the first and most important element of an effective crisis system is simply making it accessible. So fill in the blank, audience. Phil often says a crisis provider must have the minimum funding required to blank core crisis availability. So is it coordinate, implement, supervise and train? or underwrite? D should be underwrite. So let's get these votes. So are we gonna, I guess when we think through this, some of the questions have been really split in audience answers over the past few crisis years. So let's see what our answers and what the audience has come, come up with this time. Move to the next slide. All right. So we have got our answers looking like we've got coordinate. Implement at 41%, supervise and train, and D, uh, it should be underwrite. That wasn't the question, but unfortunately, the poll I had to implement I had a 27%. And so the correct answer actually is underwrite. I'm going to blame us not getting that on the third charm as the audience because the implement, the underwrite was missing as the answer. And so I didn't correct it fast enough to emphasize. But um, as it says up in the answer, crisis services that are sustainable I mean the cost of training, hiring, ramping up volume variability, and more are covered, both in startup costs as well as ongoing costs. Um, and I think that's really important when you think about um, this discussion that we're talking about and what Chris just shared as this firehouse model and being able to provide access, is that if you don't have these things covered, you're going to have two types of folks in your area, in your community, being able to do access, either not having enough capital to be able to get it done, so they can't, or they have the capital to get it done, but they want because it's a money losing situation. For them. So, good question to push forward and introduce our seat, uh, our, our main president presenter today, which is Phil Evans. Phil, are you able to come on? I am. Thanks, Chuck. Um, Thank you. I, I was, I was so excited to hear that that this uh, firehouse model question has been um, revisited uh, uh, several times. Um, I, I didn't realize that, so I was thrilled to be asked to come in and 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 talk about it. Um, you know, I, I think that um, the an important distinction, it, it, we talk a lot about the importance of capacity. And what I wanna talk about today is drilling down even farther to that part of capacity which is really about availability. And uh, I'm going to share a lot of things today that that you all, you know, that you all already know, um, no matter what part of the crisis continuum that you're working in, whether it's a crisis line, mobile crisis or crisis receiving centers, that there is this inherent unpredictability of the needs that we serve. 
it's in it's in taglines uh, like BHLs, a crisis has no schedule or protocols at times. We're the only answer or BHR. We're always here. Um, so so we, you know, we live, eat and breathe that aspect uh, uh, every day. So um, I want to drill down a little bit to this question of what it means to have the minimum funding to underwrite availability. And so let's go to the next slide. And and we'll tell go into the wayback machine here and talk a little bit about how we learned that lesson, um, because at our organization we didn't we didn't always understand that. Uh, this is an article from 1995, and and yes, that is a very uh, uh, it's a, a, a 29 year younger Phil Evans there in that in that in that grainy picture um, with with a head full of hair. Uh, the um, what we were doing at that time as the nonprofit suicide crisis hotline in Portland was looking to uh, uh, leverage our capacity by using our un uh, our our un uh, our available uh, time that our staff had. So what a great idea that we would be able to resell that availability to other organizations that needed to be able to have a, a paid, well-trained crisis counselor available 24 hours a day. And you can see in that quote there that um, we had a, a particular framework around that. It's, it's important to understand, we said, uh, actual costs. Nonprofits have a tendency not to know how much things cost. Maybe they have capacity that isn't being used. And so next slide, that's exactly what we did. And it was, and it was wildly successful uh, in a way. We, we grew the nonprofits budget by 150% a year through that division that we called protocol services at that time. Um, so between 1993 and 1996, we were going gangbusters. We brought in a hundred new funding sources separate from the county funding that we were so dependent upon. And we were generating revenue at a, a per call of five to seven dollars for for every call that we took for uh, what essentially felt like uh, uh, the icing on the cake or or gravy. Um, and we nearly grew ourselves out of business. We be you know, practically became one of those case studies. In, in in an entity that, that that grew too fast because what we didn't understand at that time, what we thought of as excess capacity was really the critical availability that needed to be funded all along, or at least a portion of that was. And we didn't understand what portion of that we, we needed to have there. We thought it was all just coming in uh, uh, right on top. So the realization at that point by 1996 was that we needed to go back to those 100 new funding sources and explain to them why it is that their rates were going to go up by three times because that's what we realized was was missing that we had been only capturing about a third of of those costs so all of that then uh is is really our connection to the firehouse model Right, this idea of the inherent unpredictability that we always deal with um, in in our work, combined with the need for speed, equals the need to value that avail availability. And when I talk about availability in this sense, I literally mean the time waiting for the next thing to occur, the 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 next phone call, the next dispatch or the next guest arriving at the front door. Um, uh, in, in our call center, that is that is literally the time that a, a counselor uh, is waiting to reach for that answer button on the phone. And in our, in our world, that's the only way that we're gonna be able to answer that call in 30 seconds, because if, if they're doing something else, if they're otherwise occupied, even on something that maybe they could shift in, a little quickly, it's going to be too late to to meet those metrics. 
So the unpredictable nature of crisis services is its variable rate of arrival. And you combine that with service level goals. And those are what uh, we think of as defining the minimum to underwrite our availability. That's, that's how you get to that. Now, next slide. And that's really, I think, the same for all of us in one way or another. Even though the math may be different, the inputs are 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 going to be um, maybe not uh, numbers of phone calls, but distance traveled. Those sorts of things are d define all of that. Uh, but across our continuum, every second counts, and 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 every minute matters. Next slide. So the firehouse model emphasizes the critical importance of the time being spent just being available to respond to a behavioral health crisis. So that's what we mean by that that minimum chunk of time. And 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 by the way, um, I've been told that I should that I should point out a, a personal connection in this photograph. Um, this photograph was sent to me last week uh, by my son, who is uh, this summer a wildland firefighter. So you can imagine um, that's not really very comfortable to get as a parent. So I uh, I found a way to put that picture to use. <laughs> Next slide. <clears throat> so let, let's talk about this parallel with the firehouse. And let's start with how we think about utilization in a in a firehouse model so for a high firehouse there's what's called a uhu unit hour utilization it's the percentage of time in a 24-hour day that a unit is assigned to an incident right meanwhile the national fire protection agency has set some standards for uh how quickly a uh, fire department should be able to be on scene. And that's five minutes and 20 seconds for not less than 90% of the dispatched incidents. So we've got this question of availability and, and speed, right? So what would you guess is the recommended unit hour utilization for a firehouse seeking to meet the standard? Specifically, then that's um, how much of the time are they busy versus how much time are they waiting for that 911 call for the engine to roll? So take a moment and think about that. Pick a number in your head. We're not going to pull you on it. Um, all right, go ahead. Let's, let's show them the number. It's 10 to 30%. So think about that. Your local firehouse is is if if they're operating within the recommended range, they may be spending as little as two and a half hours in an entire twenty four hour period, actually uh, uh, on scene, engaged in an incident. So let's go to the next slide and let's look at the parallel to that in our context. So I'm going to use I'm going to use protocols context here. Um, the equivalent of of a unit hour utilization for a call center uh, is uh, commonly referred to as agent occupancy. So that's the percentage of time that a uh, an agent is related is engaged in direct call taking. They're either talking with someone or they are finishing a call, doing a wrap up or uh, for for a firefighter, that would be termed mopping up, right? They'd be th that's that chunk of work. Um, uh, some of us who who compare to outside the crisis call center industry um, know that call centers at large generally are looking for an eighty to ninety percent occupancy rate. So that means that less than ten or twenty percent of their time is actually spent being available. That's because they have metrics that are nowhere near the kind of metrics that we have to reach. So a typical performance target in a crisis call center might be something along the lines of 90% of calls answered within 30 seconds or 80% or, uh, within 20 seconds um, uh, type of metric. So 
what do you think your percent of staff time needs to be is ready and available and 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 have have you all uh and we'll get into this be a prompt for our later discussion but do you have a sense of what that level of of time is in your operation that simply needs to be spent waiting for something to happen in that ready and available mode um, in order to reach your goals. I'm about to share what it is at protocol. Um, go ahead, next slide. What we understand in our operation is that 50% of our agent, uh, agent time is spent on the phone or, or in the wrap up after a call. So that's only about half, that's 50% occupancy. And of the remaining 50% of time, 37% of that is spent literally waiting for the call to come in. And, and that's what we found is, is necessary in order to have that 14, 15, 16 second average speed of answer um, or to reach that uh, 90 plus percent of calls answered within 30 seconds. So for us, that's what we, that was the big revelation for us years ago is needing to build that in. Um, uh, and, and that's what capacity, uh, that's means in, in our environment. So um, that's the big takeaway around, and, for for uh, uh, the the minimum to underwrite availability. So let's go to the next slide. Um, and and lest we should should think that that this is somehow that these numbers are somehow universal and can be applied. I want to uh, give a personal uh, analogy and go back to the firehouse here. So um, this is a map of Portland, um, and that's Portland Fire Station Twenty One up top, and down below you see where I live. Um, I am 2.8 miles away from uh, the firehouse, and that's pretty good. Um, your homeowner's insurance is is actually based on, in part, how far you are from a firehouse. Um, it it really uh, uh, defines some very important measures about about the risk. Um, so 2.8 miles is not is not bad. Um, the the goal I read is that it's less than uh, less than five. Um, next slide. But there's a caveat because I live on a floating home and my fire engine is not a fire engine, it's a fire boat. And that's the fire department that's going to need to come to our rescue if we ever need it. And it's going to need to come on the river. So all of a sudden, 2.8 miles takes on an entirely different scenario. This is a piece of equipment that has a more complicated coverage area, it will take longer to get to us. Um, and its utilization is most likely going to be far less, going back to that 10 to 30%. Um, my guess is, although I could not get this in time from uh, the Portland Fire Department, I, I had asked about uh, if they had a number, uh, a, a utilization rate for Fireboat 21. Um, but my guess is, or or at least my hope is, that its utilization rate is actually less because that means I'm safer and that that engine will be uh, ready and waiting uh, more of the time for me. And I think that's the big takeaway here um, in this slide is that each of us uh, have very unique situations and the common goal that 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 I would encourage this all is to find that number for you so that you can convey that to your funding sources proudly with the idea that that this is the time that your teams are waiting for something to happen because it's so important. And I think oh yeah there we go. And there's another picture of uh of my son fighting forest fires. Thank you so much, Phil, for sharing um, 
the pictures, the personal pictures. Uh, speaking of personal pictures, I'm assuming you cannot get an Uber to your house with it being in the middle of the water. <laughs> Correct. I can get an Uber to the dock. To the dock. Okay, there you go. <laughs> so that's very, very cool. But a fascinating topic. And we're going to pull up our panelists. Uh, Chris is going to return as well as David Covington. Um, but I, it, this reminded me uh, so much, uh, Phil, about some of the things that we've had in some other topics where you apply like systems engineering and those types of topics to our behavioral health field, uh, such as uh, John, Fra John Franklin uh, Sierra doing work about that in some of the California systems, and we've had production on that. It's really fascinating to me. Chris, comments, thoughts? I thought it was great. I mean, it aligns, and I'm going to share um, something we use on the Hill and with policymakers across the country, comparing physical health emergencies to behavioral health and psychiatric emergencies, um, and kind of aligning that really tends to hit well with policymakers to explain the need that someone needs to be at the phone or at the crisis center or mobile response, um, whether or not the crisis, you know, in preparation of the crisis. So, um, think that that's, those are great slides, Phil, and I'll be sharing something on the chat. Uh, that's something that we use regularly to kind of show the difference right now currently in lack of parity between behavioral uh, health emergencies and physical health. And, and David? Phil, I'll thanks. Hear your thoughts. Yeah, thanks so much, Phil, for, for this presentation. And Look, in the pre-show, Dr. Chuck, uh, you showed a, a video of uh, literally hundreds and thousands of people waiting in hospital emergency departments without active treatment, mostly being detained and secured uh, with people watching them. Uh, and there's a huge cost for those individuals being in that room. Uh, Chris, what do you think an average hospital ED visit is going to cost? I would say about... $2,000 a day. Yeah, yeah. $2,000 a day uh, is that that system. So, Phil, you're you're leaning into this great science and, and business math uh, that that you're leveraging fields, Phil, that have been around for 50, 60 years with call centers and, and mobile type services, as well as Christie's facility services. So there are all kinds of models out there. Uh, we actually, Paul Galdus and the McKinsey Health Institute team put together uh, resource at calculator.crisisnow.com to try to get to this. But at the end of the day, Chris, Phil, Dr. Chuck, there, there has to be the funding to support the medical, clinical, technical, uh, in, in, in this case, peer, whoever's answering that phone or coming out on that mobile team, it has to be resourced and, and supported. And Phil, I think this unprecedented marriage we're seeing between federal and state with 988 moving forward has to extend to an unprecedented partnership between provider organization and funders to make sure that we are resourcing this. The funding is available if we can start to map things in the right way. But these costs have been typically hitting crisis providers and then leading to crisis providers not being sustainable. Uh, what I'll mention just one thing that hit uh, the, the amount of um, costs that came out of the great pandemic that rolled to the crisis provider. Um, I, I'll throw another question at you, Chris. The cost of just personal protective equipment. Uh, uh, any idea what you spent on that during the, during the pandemic? That's a great question. And I'll say that I'm it's, I've been with Connections just over 18 months. I can get that back to you. I'm, I couldn't even imagine the cost of that. But yeah, I but know we were open throughout the pandemic, um, and we followed all the safety protocols throughout. So yeah. um, I agree, as well as I know Paul talks about um, sometimes having to use agency staff to cover shifts. Exactly. That's where I was going, Chris. Is yeah. uh, <laughs> I, no, that's perfect. I was. Uh, I was. We were stung. Uh, those those outside agency costs of filling a nursing or or a physician position, and we've always used that sum. These are three sixty five services, twenty four seven. Uh, you've got a hole that you can't fill with a full time, a part time, or a pool staff, and you've got to have that nursing role filled. You've got to have that doc role filled, that nurse practitioner role filled. In twenty nineteen, we spent right at one point six million dollars on those outside agency costs, and in twenty twenty. Two, we spent 
13 million dollars uh, wow. on those those costs so phil this this ability if we're going to have a sustainable predictable system we've got to start to redirect those resources do it in an intelligent way and i love the methodology you shared today thanks david you know and 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 just to drill uh home on on uh you know the the Erlang C and the Monte Carlo simulations and all of those models, absolutely. And what we learned is it 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 actually starts uh, for, for us. Someone someone term gave me this term years ago, and I, I forget where it came from. But this idea of poor self, poor pricing, self esteem is, is what we were accused of, right? The this idea of of um, of you know we can't ask for too much, and I think for for the idea of standing in that value of of that 37% of the time at protocol that our call center agents are waiting for that next call rather than trying to justify it by you know we can get additional revenue sources elsewhere we can we can use that um we can resell it we can re reuse it in other ways is is actually um uh, risking us discarding the value of 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 that, and I think we're making great progress. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, we were thrilled um, at the movement when when uh, you know early in the nine eight eight rollout when when Vibrant and SAMHSA uh, 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 distributed their their estimations of of the cost per call, and and we're looking at numbers that were you know sixty seventy eighty even ninety dollars a call. Um, and you remember from the slides, you know, in, in the mid '90s, we were we were thinking that five to seven dollars a call was like uh, uh, icing on the cake. So we really have come a long, long way. And and I'm not sure that's enough just yet either, given all of the additional demands on the systems. But but it but but we're definitely making progress and and standing in that value, and and recognizing internally even in our own managers and our own supervisors, um, really working to curate and, and understand the value of, of the time that we're, that we're waiting for something to happen. It's the business that we're in. Hey, hey Phil, we've got a few more minutes and I've, I've got a question that I put in the chat that I would love to throw to you and, and possibly David or Chris too, if you had any pearls about this. And that was, as I looked at the uh, numbers that you shared, um, you it basically calculated out that it looked like you would spend in every hour for a party call for your call center, your utilization, about 30 minutes in occupancy. And then of that leftover 30 minutes, it'd be a little over 10 minutes of availability time. And then the less than 20 minutes left doing other functions. Um, and I had a question, any thoughts on what is the value of that availability time? Is there anything that that you have pearls to share that you could support staff in? On, in that availability time that maintains their availability right. and maintains their efficiency and performance during their occupancy time um, without impacting that? Or do you yep. just, is it better to just let them be available? That is that is a great question, Chuck. And I have to correct something and I'm glad you brought it up because I, I, I wanna emphasize that 50% occupancy and that 37% adds up to 87% of an hour. Oh, yeah, said yeah. Of it wasn't. Yeah, of the time. I, I okay. might have mis. I might have misled okay. when I said it was 30% of the remaining. No, it's it's actually bigger than that. It's a third, more than a third, of of an agent's time is waiting. So uh, that makes your question even even more important. Of course, we all want to find things that that are valuable. Uh, we do a lot of things in the call center context um, during that time, but they all have to be immediately able to be um, uh, uh, discarded, right? Like I have to immediately be able to stop that. Um, if it's something that takes me a minute, two minutes, three minutes to transition away from, well, then I've already missed my service level target. So that would include things like uh, we do a lot of a lot of distributed QI. A lot of our staff are doing QI um, on their own calls, on their own documentation, on others. And like uh, there, there, there's there's training opportunities that can be immediately uh, 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 finished. We um, we got a lot of things like that. The key is that it has to be in seconds. I have to be able to go. Oh, 
I'm done with that and I'm answering the call because otherwise I've missed the boat. Oh, that's that's really the vibe, Phil. I, it was fascinating to me just thinking about that. I think that's applicable to mobile teams, call centers, and other uh, areas in, in all continuum of the crisis spectrum, uh, but but being most most helpful with that. So those are the good pearls on that. And I think John Draper said similar uh, that, you know, using that as a as a time for professional development. But like you said, being able to just immediately pivot and get to the call when that avail so that you are available in that time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much today, Phil. That's very, very interesting topic and really hits home with some of the things we've been sequencing over the past few weeks. Next, I think it's time to go to SAMHSA. And I believe Carissa is on today. Hey, Chris. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Thanks for having us on. I want to talk about something exciting today. Uh, we are planning our what we hope is going to be the first of an annual 988 day uh, for September 8th of this year uh, and then every year following, hopefully. Uh, and what that is, is a day to create pod positive buzz around 988 uh, and its related activities across the country. Uh, every year, we'll probably have a different tagline. This year's tagline will be No Judgment, Just Help, which came from our 988 formative research that we did uh, last November. And then again, earlier uh, this year that we released about trusted messengers, that was the big um, message that resonated with a lot of people across different races and ages uh, and walks of life. So we're using that in our first 988 day. Um, and our big call to action is for anyone involved in 988 or who wants to be involved in 988 to share this message with your community, uh, with the people you work with or see every day in whatever um, creative way you want to do it and whatever fun way you want to do it and whatever resonates with your community and to share what you're doing online with the, the hashtag 988 day. Uh, and then we will put it up on a wall and let everybody know what's happening. And we hope to be able to share hundreds of really cool and exciting things that people are talking about out there across America uh, about 988 on 988 day, um, which again will be September 8th. Um, and the first thing uh, I wanted to draw everybody's attention to is we are doing an activation workshop next Monday um, at 2.30. And during, everybody's invited to it. Um, I will share the, the link um, there. We sent an email out to everybody who the TTAC has an email address for, uh, but we can share it um, with, with the Recovery International folks uh, right after this call. And if you would forward it to everybody in, in your um, listserv, that would be great. And you can sign up for the activation workshop, or you can watch it later because we're going to record it. But all that's going to be is we're going to um, talk about the day and what we think it can be. We're going to share some ideas that we've heard from partners across the U.S. Uh, and just open the floor up for conversation about what people want to do that day, what they're thinking, what let have a big idea sharing about how can we spread the word in a creative way. Um, we will be creating a digital toolkit that will have some ideas and some materials that people can print and use on the day. Uh, that'll be available next Monday as well. Uh, and then we are putting up a website this week. Hopefully we're working on that now uh, and we'll send around the link for that as well. And I just wanted to let everybody here know because, um, you know, you're out there doing the work. Uh, it would be amazing if you would share in the day uh, and spread the word about the great work you're doing and the availability of help for people. Oops, I had no mute. That's a shame point. So now I'd like to introduce our Nashville folks, uh, Dr. Brian Sims and Arlene Stevenson, to talk to us about things going on at Nashville. 
Hey, Dr. Sims. <laughs> First of all, Chuck, thank you so much. This has been a wonderful jam and to fill for the uh, very timely discussion. Uh, as far as NASPIT updates today, just briefly a couple of them, but I wanted to begin uh, by turning it over to my colleague, Arlene Stevenson, who's the senior advisor with NASPIT, to speak on a webinar that's coming up. So Arlene, go for it. Hi, thanks for having us today. I wanted to tell you about a webinar um, that we will be offering, uh, Vibrant and NASPIT, uh, this vibrant, this uh, webinar is called Successful Grant Writing for 988 Suicide and Crisis Lifeline Centers. Uh, it's very comprehensive, so it's going to be in two parts on August 8th and the 27th from 1 to 2 in the afternoon. Uh, the first part of the webinar will begin with some researching grant opportunities, which grants are the best to apply for. Uh, what is the importance of building relationships with funders and uh, a review of preparing for grants and standard grant writing formats. Uh, the second part of the webinar will highlight grant writing challenges, uh, identifying some of the key elements of grant uh, proposals, what makes them successful, and how to promote your organization with, with potential funders. Uh, we're going to end the webinar on the second day with some uh, question and answer sessions. Uh, we're really lucky to have the speaker that uh, is coming to talk with us. Um, she's a trainer on this topic. Her name is Dr. Beverly Browning, and she is truly an expert in this field. She is the uh, founder and director of the Grant Writing Foundation. She teaches grant writing at universities, and she's the author of of only 48 books on grant writing. Um, the webinar will provide some uh, time, um, real-time captioning, uh, ASL interpretation, and it will be recorded. So check the chat uh, for the registration information. And after registering, you'll get a confirmation email uh, that will tell you about how to join the meeting. So we hope you can join us. Ready. Well, thank you so much, Arlene. And thank I just you. want to remind folks that the uh, link is in your chat box. So please feel free to reference that uh, again beginning tomorrow. Uh, the last piece, Chuck, I just wanted to speak a little bit on the most recent NASPED annual conference. And NASPED hosts a conference each year with the commissioners and with various division members that talk about uh, specific topics. This year's focus has been around 988 and the papers that have been written in that regard. And while I won't go over all of the papers or otherwise, I wanted to uh, just kind of centralize a theme that came out of this particular annual conference. And it's been about the amazing amount of work and resources and accomplishments that have taken place since the uh, uh, 988 uh, startup in July of 2022. Uh, one of which, and there were a number of wonderful presentations throughout the annual conference, but I wanted to reference one that was more so towards the end. And this was a fireside chat that took place uh, about crisis services, crisis standards, and beyond crisis services, looking ahead into the next year. Because we've had lots of discussions amongst all of the states and the jurisdictions about where 988 is headed and looking at it in a very optimistic sense. So we had a uh, diverse but wonderful uh, opportunity to network with four individuals, uh, Chuck Ngoglio, who's uh, the president and CEO of the National Council for Mental Health, uh, Mental Wellbeing. We also had Kana Onomoto, who's a senior knowledge expert and associate partner with McKinsey Health Institute. We had Nanette Larson, Deputy Director of Wellness and Recovery Systems with the Illinois Department of Human Services, and Dr. Joan Galise, who's the Director of our own National Nashville Center for Innovations in Health Policy and Practice. These four individuals were absolutely phenomenal with regards to expressions about where things are. And what we did was we took a look at where 988 is, where it is going, some of the challenges, some of the resources, but basically came through with a premise that suggested that things are moving in the right direction. And this is a message that we'd like to have carried because these four individuals presented local resources, their own uh, conceptualizations, but it's part of a larger picture 
that really takes a look at where 988 is and how it is moving in such a positive direction. So I just wanted to make people aware of that, Chuck. And uh, I thank you for the time. I thank Sansa for the obvious opportunity and our participation with them. So back to you, Chuck. Thanks, Brian. Uh, that was a great present. That was a great uh, presentation at Nashville. And I, my one of my take homes is I remember you just teasing Joan about how long you guys have been working together. So that was my big take home. Not really, but it was fun. It was hung in my brain. So Dave from Dave Atkins is coming in from Listen to talk to us a little bit more about how to be an informed AI crisis care consumer. But in light of this discussion of underwriting, you know, anytime AI can increase the efficiency of the occupancy time of, of a staff person in this crisis support, it, it helps the, some of those equations that we were discussing, as well as many other things I'm sure you're going to share with us. Yeah, thank you so much, Chuck. Uh, great to be here as always. Um, and today we are wrapping up a, a quick four-part series on how to be an informed AI consumer. Uh, we've touched on really foundational issues like what is AI, what isn't it, um, key ingredients in AI quality, things like demonstrating that AI is valid, that it's reliable, that it's not biased. Um, last month, my colleague Zach Immel talked a little bit about generative AI, which has been center stage uh, in popular culture, courtesy of ChatGPT. And, and today I wanna to talk a little bit about some of the use cases for AI in crisis care. Uh, I'm not gonna be talking about specific products, that's not my role here, but just wanna talk about where are some of the initial AI tools being developed within crisis care? Um, next slide, please. And to, to think about this, uh, it, I wanna highlight two kind of core functions of AI tools. Um, and again, this is not uh, AI as a general system, that kind of image of a, of a robot AI. This is AI tools that have a specific purpose and were designed for a specific purpose. One of the things that AI is good at is identifying particular types of content or text. That could be in a conversation, such as a uh, a call taker, uh, help seeker conversation, or or in other settings, um, and and it AI is also really good at generating naturalistic, human like text. And so, where might this show up in crisis care? Now, if you could click forward, um, we are often either for training purposes, for supervision, or for quality assurance, we're wanting to find particular types of conversations particular elements within conversations. Um, and, and so AI has a nice match with that. Similarly, one of the things that we have to do is we have to document, um, whether that's the, you know, the various types of calls or contacts throughout crisis care. Um, and AI is pretty good at summarizing and writing uh, uh, a naturalistic summary. So let's take, take a little bit deeper look at each of these. Uh, next uh, slide. Uh, and by an interesting, happy coincidence, um, uh, Listen is collaborating with Protocol, courtesy of a NIH grant, actually on this particular topic. Um, so it's great to to see Phil, and and I didn't actually know you were going to be here. So, um, so one of the one of the key things that we can do with AI is develop it to identify particular types of relevant content. Um, and so if we have done that well and we've developed valid, reliable, uh, and unbiased AI, then we can identify things like when is a caller um, making a, a, a risk statement? When are they talking either explicitly or uh, passively about suicide? Um, we can then identify key things that we would want all of our call takers to do in response to that, things like assessing for current and past suicidality um, and uh, the severity, intent, whether there are, is a specific plan, means, and so on. Um, of course, uh, human supervisors and quality managers can do this. And the advantage of AI is that ability to take that to scale, um, to be able to, as, as we have just celebrated 988's 
to your birthday and saw how many millions of contacts there have been, AI has the potential to go to that scale of millions of contacts and evaluating and pulling out key information that then we can use for training, supervision, and quality assurance. Next slide, please. In addition, all of those contacts have to be documented in some way. And uh, oftentimes the core piece of documentation is just a quick summary of, of what occurred uh, in, in that conversation or that contact. And AI is quite good at that. Um, stepping away from crisis care specifically within uh, AI applications within healthcare generally, this is a very, very active area. Um, what are the ways, uh, what are the various ways that AI can speed documentation? And so some of the really big players in the AI world, OpenAI, Microsoft, and others are pursuing how, how that can, uh, how AI can assist documentation generally. Uh, but this core element of how can we quickly summarize, draft summarize uh, the content of, of a conversation or one of our contacts is a is a core feature of uh, generative AI. Next slide. Um, so here on Tech Corner, I, I give you just really almost kind of sound bites around AI um, in uh, in the amount of time I get. Uh, I wanted to let folks know that there's a upcoming upcoming webinar that I'll participate in along with uh, Dave Jobs, Julie Goldstein, and Ursula Whiteside, and that'll be a longer hour long kind of open ended conversation about crisis care and applications of technology. Um, and so if you'd like to hear a little bit more and, and with various perspectives on that, uh, would welcome you to uh, join us here in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Thank so, you so much, much, Dave. Appreciate you sharing those things with us. Tom, are you on? I am Dr. Chuck. How are you? Can you hear me? Okay. I sure can. So, Excellent. Um, Stephanie, unfortunately, couldn't be here today, so I'm going to take the role of, of her part uh, in this discussion. Uh, in this article, you know, we covered this, uh, it's kind of a, a re reemergence, but I thought it might be good to take a look at this article and the hope and some of the things in it and apply the lens of it's been a year. Where do you think this has evolved or not evolved uh, as we've gone through from this from July, last July to this August? Yeah, so I think. First, uh, a shout out to Stephanie. She does such a great job in putting these articles together. You know, sort of follow, and then she makes something come up that's incredibly thoughtful. So, she does a wonderful job with all of this. Um, you know, I I feel like first of all, change is incremental, right? I think we all acknowledge that there's been a tremendous amount of change as it relates to 988 and crisis systems here over the past year, and I think we've seen continued progress as it relates to the intersection of Medicaid coming to support the behavioral health infrastructure, right? And I think great proof of that is the Medicaid director letter that came out within the last couple of months out of CMCS. And we've talked about that on this calls in terms of some of the funding opportunities that are highlighted in that letter and, and ways for states to be thinking about financing options to help support 988 infrastructure and mobile crisis interfaces and, and other important aspects of the overall system design. Um, and the article also touches on lessons learned from wonderful lady Kate Aurelius in terms of, you know, the importance of being able to partner with individuals that have lived experience. And, and we continue to see that as an important aspect as well in terms of, you know, Medicaid and advisory committees, that have members, individuals that um, are, are receiving Medicaid services to get input. And I, I continue, I, I believe that will continue to help shape systems for them. So ultimately, crisis systems are really one of those true rare opportunities in the healthcare delivery system where we can advance the triple aim, right? We can improve individual outcomes, we can reduce overall costs, and at the end of the day, we can improve population health. And, and to me, you know, we need to continue all that we're doing in terms of support for the development of these crisis systems. It was great to be on this call today to hear about the firehouse model. You know, it's something that my mentor, Kate Aurelius, preached about all the time 15 years ago. Um, and, and here we are today in terms of seeing and the opening of new crisis service systems in different states. And so 
Um, you know, we're making incremental progress. I wish it would move more quickly. I know we all would wish it would move more quickly, but the progress is happening and we need to continue with our efforts in lifting this up. And I think this call is just a great example of that, where we regularly have a couple hundred people or more come together weekly to talk about the opportunities that are out there and how we advance this. So, Tom, if I can, uh, we've got a couple of extra minutes. If I could squeeze in a couple of questions, I think are right down your alley. I don't know if you saw them. Uh, but they, they tie into this article too. But as we discussed the underwriting uh, firehouse model and some of the systems that Phil described, we talked about this availability time. I believe it was Andrew Guy that asked the question in the chat. Um, you know, any thoughts on Medicaid CMS's role in being able to uh, cover that cost and how to do that when it's not necessarily a billable service directly one to one with the person during that time. And it's a significant chunk of the time. Yeah, you know, I, I think Medicaid has a lot of leeway in establishing rates and how they think about rates. And at the end of the day, rates need to cover the cost of delivering those services for the Medicaid allocable piece. Right? And part of that piece is to recognize the fact that there is sort of this downtime associated with it. When you look at all of the infrastructure that exists to pay for ambulances and other things like that, when you look at most states, they have cost-based reimbursement. That cost-based reimbursement looks at downtime as it relates to having the infrastructure available. And so, again, I think Medicaid has a lot of discretion and they think about this and they need to think about this, you know, in a broad sense in terms of all the various factors that lead to the costs of supporting the infrastructure. Got one more question to ask for your expertise, uh, Nick David Pearls. Um, so earlier, again, when we were talking about uh, during Phil's talk, Phil used the term poor pricing self-esteem. Um, in in advocating for the costs and the and the funding that's needed to truly yeah. underwrite all services, um, David called it standing in our value related to a term that we use at Recovery Innovations. Any pearls on systems as they're setting this up, being aware of that dynamic and partnering with the funders that be and entities to be entities that be to avoid that so that they really can get the capital to support and underwrite startup and continued access to yeah. care. You know, I, at the end of the day, Medicaid agencies want to get this right too, right? They don't want to create something that is going to fail. To help really succeed, um, you know, organizations lean on those individuals that have the expertise. Right? And so being able to bring information forward to your Medicaid partners, to your Medicaid organizations in terms of what the true, true costs are, I, I think, you know, most people are open to receiving that information and trying to make systems work. And so... You need to bring information forward and you need to present it in a way that's going to help inform individuals what the true costs are of maintaining these systems. And so I think that's incredibly important in terms of being able to help educate those that are having to make very difficult decisions in terms of, you know, oftentimes the lack of, uh, you know, the type of information that's necessary to set rates. Um, so we could sit and talk for minutes all day, Chuck. I still appreciate you taking the extra time to help cover some of the questions in the chat. And thoughts and oh, so very much appreciate it. Thanks, Tom. All right. Thanks, Dr. Chuck. Take care. And uh, and just uh, one other piece as we're getting ready to close, as we were covering that, Phil said it's just really important to uh, know um, and to know what your costs are. And so I think that's one of the lessons to take take home from this is continued. Um, improvements in our understanding of the business math, the systems engineering of these types of things as we roll them forward. Um, so uh, really excited about the close of today and all the things that we covered and how they all interlace uh, together. Um, my dear friend, Joy Brunson and Subaga is going to be in our next episode presenting a special topic on medication assisted treatment services um, is connected to crisis care. So really looking forward to her presentation next week. And then in the next episode, 186, um, Sarah uh, will be presenting uh, works with the Trevor Project on special topic of 988 and LGBTQ plus youth specialized services. So please mark your calendar for both of those. Um, and then August 28th, as it says in the chat, we'll mark it because we will be live at a hybrid meeting. Uh, during that. Also really appreciate um, all the comments in the chat, helping support uh, some new ideas for some new topics that were that multiple people listed. Hey, we'd like to hear about this and hey, we'd like to hear about that. 
please continue to put those in the chat as well as send in emails and contacts um, so that we can continue to bring content that's meaningful um, and informative uh, as well as inspirational towards our movement of continuing to drive this care forward. Thank you guys so much for your time in this crisis jam. I always appreciate doing this. I need a good sign off like Dr. John Draper has, but I don't have one for today, but thanks for watching. Bye.